a lot of people who started the course last semester can't make it Mondays at 5.30 anymore. So I am starting, uh, I'm going to record these. Uh, I'm getting a little bit less uh, hesitant about like revealing comp like my client's information and stuff like that because I'm not really touching a lot of that stuff. So that's that should be pretty good. So uh, I'm just going to share my desktop here. Oh, this is... Let me just smear my displays. Um, there we go. Okay. So it should be recording. And if it's not, at least I'm teaching to you guys. So that's cool. Uh, again, Happy New Year. Um, technical difficulties always like take the wind out of me. So it's going to take me a while to get into my normal effervescent self. Um, okay, so how many people here were able to watch? Uh, there was a couple recorded ones since we've we've been off. Uh, getting to know Ruby. How many people were able to watch that? Okay. Uh, using embedded Ruby. How many people were able to watch that? Not very many. Okay. And then uh, obviously advanced CSS. You guys couldn't watch because it wasn't recorded. Um, okay. So unfortunately, I'm not going to go over that stuff again. So please, when you have the chance, like really as soon as possible go over those videos because all the stuff going forward, although you can get by, you can copy what I'm typing, uh, it'll make a lot more sense if you go over those videos, okay? Some of the, some of the key aspects of it I will repeat um, because it's just, the, the lecture really won't make sense otherwise. Um, but really like uh, getting to know Ru Ruby is a, a really good place to start. Again, just learning the Ruby language, okay? So if we were doing JSP, if we were doing C-sharp, stuff like that, you would learn those languages, right? So if you learn Java in, in class, like a next logical web application step would be using JSP or whatever variants they have of that now. So, because what you're doing is you're using Java code to spit out HTML responses and stuff like that, okay? So to learn Ruby on Rails, it's the same kind of thing. And a lot of people go the other way around, though. They learn the Ruby on Rails as a web application framework. And in, le in learning Ruby on Rails, they learn Ruby and then go back and learn more Ruby. Okay, that's how I did it. I didn't, I didn't start as a Ruby programmer and then learn Ruby on Rails. I, I learned Ruby on Rails and through Ruby on Rails, I learned Ruby. And then I went back to learn more Ruby, okay? So um, it would have been ideal if we went from one to the other. Um, but again, like Ruby itself is like learning Java. You could spend years learning it. Okay, so the getting to know Ruby uh, video just gives you a little bit of an introduction there, um, gets you to some of the key concepts. But that being said, we will be coding Ruby uh, as we go on. Okay, we'll be coding a lot of Ruby stuff there, and, and then embedded Ruby, which is what I covered last week, is the ability to use constructs like if statements, loops, uh, you know, loop th uh, iterating through arrays. Uh, not only that, variables, calculations. All the stuff, all the fancy stuff you typically associate with Ruby, but embedding that in HTML, OK? Um, so that's, that's a really powerful thing. So how many people here have coded an if statement in their life? OK, how many people have coded a loop? OK, awesome. So what? Uh, somebody tell me what the advantage of a loop is. It sounds really stupid, but what's the advantage of a loop? You don't have to rewrite the code. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the biggest things, right? We're using the smarts of a computer so we don't have to rewrite code, right? And especially if we're able to loop through a bunch of values, right? I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, output this sentence 30 times so that, you know, people get it, right? I mean, that's one thing. But it's really powerful when, you, when you're able to iterate or loop over values, right? So if you have a bunch of, say, uh, marks, okay? So let's say we're in a classroom and I, I evaluated all your guys' exams. It'd be sweet if I could loop through all those marks and I'll put the same statement for all those marks and say like, uh, you know, your mark was 85% on this test, the average was 75%. And then the next person would say, your mark is 25%, that's a really low mark, and the average was 75%, okay? That person must have brought the average way down. Um, but that's the advantage, right? Is you're able to write uh, a simple piece of code and you're iterating over it and filling that with values, okay? HTML inherently does not have this ability. HTML it doesn't allow loops. It doesn't allow if statements. Um, it doesn't allow variables. It doesn't allow a whole lot of things. Okay, and that's the uh, kind of power of embedded Ruby is you're able to use if constructs, loops, variables, calculations, any kind of server side processing you can think of. You can embed that in HTML. So watch that video. You get a really good idea of how that works. Okay, the big big take home message though from that 
is the ability to establish variables inside the controller and use them in your views. Okay, so that I will repeat. Okay, so um, basically, this is my client code that I just said I wouldn't review. <laughs> uh, what are we test? Uh, actually, we don't have a project set up for this. File open Rails projects test app. Okay, so where we left off. Uh, last semester was we had just set up um, a very basic controller called the pages controller and what we did there is we actually had no code inside here but all we had was um, we just had this basically we had def home and what I said is you can choose to render any template you wanted okay so typically you would call it the same thing that you end up rendering right? so def home and you would render the home template now what I mentioned is that Ruby on Rails uses a convention that whatever you end up rendering, it's going to look for in a specific place, just by default. You can put it wherever you want, but if you follow its convention, it'll look in one certain place, and then you don't have to do this extra coding, okay? So typically, what you would do is you would look in a view folder, okay, and slash the name of the template, okay? So if you go to the views, there would be some folder here named something, and inside that folder, you have the name of a template. But if you follow the convention, it's always going to look in a folder and name the same thing as your controller, okay? So pages controller, it's going to look for views inside the pages folder, okay? If you had news posts controller, it would look in the news posts folder. If you had blog posts controller, it would look for in the blogs folder, okay? It does fall in Ruby on Rails convention. So once it's in that folder, it looks for a template by the name of whatever you called it, render home, okay? So you could have said render... Um, ho uh, about, or house, or whatever you want, okay? And then you just have to name the template that name, okay? So if I, if I want to render whatever you want, I specify whatever you want.html.erv, okay? And that's what, it that, that's what it does. Now, another Ruby on Rails convention that says is that if you happen to name your template the exact same as the action, okay, remember this is the name of the action, you don't even have to put it down at all. That's what it's assuming, OK? So if you render home, all right, it's going to naturally assume that. So you don't even have to put that down, OK? So that's what we ended up with before the semester. We just have to step home. And by default, it's going to look in the pages folder, because you're, you're in the pages controller. And it's going to look for home.html.erb. So we ended up with something in here, OK? Now, the, the video from last week, I started talking about embedded Ruby, OK? Um, somebody had, had mentioned on the uh, video that uh, uh, ASP.NET, I believe, uses the same server-side tags. Um, I think JSP does the same thing. Uh, PHP uses something kind of similar. How many people have programmed PHP here before? OK, so PHP, you guys are probably used to uh, something that looks like this, right? Something that looks like that. And what that means is that is called server-side tags. Okay, in other words, what happens in here is anytime you see this tag here, less than with a percent sign, okay, what that means is that is not native HTML. Okay, a browser will not understand that. So before we send this back as a response, okay, before we send this back to the browser, we have to evaluate those things first. We have to get the values for those things, put in something that HTML will under browsers will understand, and return that. OK? That's what render does. OK? When you, when you call render in here, OK, render is going to do uh, three or four things. Let's see how many of my time I've been talking here. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to seek out that template for you. OK? So it's going to find home.html.erb. And where is it going to find that? In the pages folder, right? Just by default. Again, you could put whatever you want. But by default, it's going to search in the pages folder. So it finds that home.html.erb. That's the first thing it does. It seeks it out for you. The second thing it does is it does some server-side processing to turn anything in here that's a server-side tag into something that HTML or browsers will understand. OK? So any, anywhere where you see this thing, and so you see it here, OK? You see it here. You see it here. Um, this is a little bit different, but I'll explain that in a second. You see it here, 
uh, you see it here. And you also have a loop around that stuff. But basically, what it's doing here is that render is going to go through this and say, OK, what's the value of the username variable? What's the value of user balance? What's the value of user due date? Replace those service side tags with an actual value. OK, so like 36.5 or KC Lee, D or KC Lee, right? If, if it was just plain text that said KC Lee, browsers can understand that. Browsers can understand straight up text, OK? Uh, we have build your account in the amount of $200. Okay, again, something that browsers will understand that plain text. Okay, and it'll fill this out. And then once it's filled that out, okay, so that's the second thing that's done. The third thing it'll do is take this whole piece of HTML after it's been processed, okay, and slap it into the layout. We talked about this last semester as well. Okay, we didn't talk about it in super amount of detail, but basically what we said is that by default, it'll take your template and throw it into where yield is, OK? The HTML stuff is common to every page at this point. The body, all that stuff is common. We had a question last semester about, well, what if you want different JavaScript tags and all that stuff? We'll talk about that coming down the line. But by default, it uses this template. You can add whatever you want to this to apply to every page. And then what it does is it throws the, the resulting processing of home.html.arb and throws it into the yield. Then it wraps that up in an HTTP, HTTP response and sends it back. Okay, that's what render does. Very powerful function. Okay, as far as you're concerned, though, all you have to think about is you can code your HTML, you can add server-side tags anywhere you want, and then you can also uh, throw it into a layout. Okay, so this is all review. This is all in the videos. Uh, go over them, and you'll get a better handle on it. Okay. Uh, I, I still didn't get to my take home from last week, though. The big take home, though, OK, the really big take home here is that this is your view. OK, and philosophically, your view should only be in charge of presenting data. OK, so once you have your data, you know, you have your name, you have your array of values, uh, you have you know, your balance, whatever you may have, once you have that data, this view is just meant to present it, OK? So this code right here is pretty good, all right? This, all this is doing is just putting in values, OK? There is a loop here, OK? Loops are generally OK, too. That's, that's fine. Um, but if you were to get into any really complex calculations, let's say, for example, I want to calculate the user balance before I presented it, you could technically do a bunch of stuff here if you wanted. You could say, you know, at user balance equals $200 to start off with, and then user balance is equal to at user balance, you know, times 1.13 for tax. And then let's say there is also a discount for this guy. So we'll give him a 5% discount, and so on and so forth. You can theoretically do that, OK? But your view is getting ugly, because you are now doing uh, complex calculations. You're doing maybe perhaps initialization, all that stuff like that. Again, technologically, there's nothing wrong with it, but stylistically, it's bad because your view should not be this complex. Okay, your view should be just presenting data. Okay, so the question is, where do we put that code? We put that code in the controller, typically. Okay, your controller is where you do all your complex uh, calculations. You do your reading and writing to databases. You do variable initialization. You do all that kind of stuff, and you just set up all those variables that you're going to pass to the view, and the view just presents it. OK, so typically, you wouldn't have the code in here. Typically, you would have that code in the controller of the corresponding action, by the way. OK, so home is rendering home, so we put it in the home action. OK, and you would do initialization like here. OK? But the big take home message of where to put your code. OK, you want to make your views as, as lean as possible. Do all the heavy lifting inside the controller. You may even. Do isolate that to a separate method, you know, and have like an initialized method or something like that. Obviously, we have some object-oriented programmers in the room. Probably, we'd want to throw this into an object, you know, and we do all that in the controller. And what links the two is that at sign. Okay, who here has ever coded a class in their life? Okay, who here has ever instantiated a class or an object from that class? Good. I'd hope you'd done both if you'd done one. Or maybe you're just at that point in the lecture. I don't know. 
Um, so you guys know what instance variables are, right? Or at least most of you do, OK? Um, if you don't, I, I, I'm, I un, unfortunately can't go through object-oriented programming in this course. Um, you'll still be able to follow along, but this will make a lot more sense if you do a little bit of reading on object-oriented programming and classes and instances. Long story short, a class is a blueprint. An instance is actually taking that blueprint and creating something, OK? So you may have a person class that generally has an age, hair color, eye color, so on and so forth. And you're going to create a person from that that has a specific age, specific hair color, and so on and so forth. And you guys know what instance variables are, right? They're like pieces of data that are attached to that specific instance that you can operate on, right? That's what object-oriented programming is all about, is isolating your groups of data together, right? So a person is really, an instance is nothing more than just a group of data, OK? Well, in Ruby, the at sign is an instance variable, OK? The at sign declares an instance variable, right? But in this specific case, and how Ruby on Rails programmers programmed controller classes, OK? Pages controller extends application controller. OK, they programmed it, programmed it in a way that any instance variable within a method will be, accessed, will be accessible by its rendered template. OK, so you're not treating instance variables, in this case, the same way you typically deal with instance variables, OK? Instance variables for controllers specifically, the way you use them, is that whatever you establish here is accessible in the view template, OK? So if I had just username, that would be a perfectly legitimate variable declaration, no question. But this would not be accessible in the view, OK? So you have to create an instance variable, and now if I do that, I can access it here. If you didn't do that, it would spit out an error saying, uh, you know, variable doesn't exist, basically. OK, and remember, in Ruby, Ruby, you don't have to do variable declarations ahead of time. You can just do the, the very first time you assign it a value, it's uh, declared. OK, so that's where we left off last week. Um, and then again, we don't really need render home because it is doing that automatically. Okay. So let me just show you quickly what this looks like. Uh, where is this? Oh, it's just in my home. Okay, so what we have here is I have a variable called username, a variable called user balance, a variable called user due date, and a variable called user values, which just happens to be an array of values. And then what I'm doing is just filling in those values here, 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 and then here I'm looping over usage values, and for inside the loop I'm outputting this HTML. This is really cool. Okay, this is when embedded Ruby becomes really powerful because I'm mixing the idea of a Ruby loop, but the body of that loop, okay, is HTML. Okay, so this is the loop that's iterating over, and inside the loop, instead of doing some Ruby code, I can actually put some HTML code in there, and it'll loop over those values and put them out, and that's how I'm getting this. Okay, again, I don't want to spend too long on this because this was all last week's stuff. Okay, all right, any questions on that? Cool. All right, today we are getting into a very big topic and probably we'll spend the most of the rest of the course on this topic, okay? And that is all about building a RESTful resource, okay? There's a lot of terms for this. Um, if you Google RESTful resource, you might not get exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I've seen a couple of people refer to it as RESTful resource. It makes more sense to me because it's basically a resource that adheres to RESTful principles, okay? How many people here have heard of REST before? How many people have used it but not really understood what it means like theoretically? Okay, that's what most of us are. And that's me, myself, to be honest. You can read papers and papers about REST. I tried to really understand this hardcore stuff and teach it. REST is a little bit abstract, okay? There's a lot of principles about REST, okay? And it talks about how objects need to be uniquely identifiable. They need to be operated with CRUD actions. They need to be able to be operated in a stateless way and all this stuff like that, right? And it gets very theoretical. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that here. But if you don't understand the principle of REST itself, don't worry, OK? When you follow our coding examples in this class, you'll naturally be building a RESTful resource, OK? Now, what's the deal with a resource? OK, so again, how many people here have done object-oriented programming? OK, sweet. So object-oriented programming, for those who don't know, is basically programming your, 
programs to be um, structured around objects. Okay, so when you read a problem, a client comes to you and says, hey, uh, you know, I have this project that I want to do, and what it is, it's gonna, kind of going to be like Facebook. And um, it's going to be Facebook for University of Ottawa specifically. Uh, I want people to be able to sign up. Uh, I want people to be able to, uh, you know, add uh, colleagues, you know, uh, that are in my class. I want people to be able to add their classes. I want people to be able to comment on things. I want people that be able to post uh, hilarious pictures and so on and so forth. Okay. And when you hear that, when you hear that problem statement brought to you, you as a software engineer need to start thinking about how you're going to design this application. And what object-oriented programming teaches us is we start to pick out the objects in that problem statement. Okay, there's the idea of a user. Okay, so we probably want to store some information about a user. We want to have the idea of classes. Okay, we want to have the idea of posts. We want to have the idea of photos and so on and so forth. And this, was, this is what object-oriented programming is all about, right? And you design each one of those objects. You say, users will probably have an email address, a first name, a last name, and maybe a year of graduation. You know, photos will have tags, all these kind of things. Okay, that's what object-oriented design is all about. Um, did anybody, you guys take that class with Timothy Lethbridge? 2101, 2100? 2105. 2105 now. Okay, so that, that's, that course, I mean, was all about that. That, that textbook is actually a very good basis in uh, software engineering and how to design software, especially from object-oriented principles. Resources takes that one step further, OK? Ruby on Rails still is an object-oriented programming language. So you're still going to program objects. And you're still going to design those objects. And you're going to design those objects with properties, OK? And instance methods and all that stuff, okay? and class methods and all that jazz. So you're going to design all that stuff. But you're going to build on top of those objects. Okay, you're going to build on top of those objects, and what you're going to do is you're going to build a standard way to interact with those objects. Okay, all objects generally you'll be able to do CRUD actions on. Okay, CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, Destroy. Okay, typical thing to interact with an object, right? Um, you will do these actions in a very standard way. Okay, you'll do them with web requests in a very standard way. You will label all your, your objects in a very standard way. Okay, um, The way they interact with the database is a very standard way. And all these things amount to a resource. Okay, You know when you design software and you're like, oh, this, like the more objects, the more things you can represent as objects, the better and more modular uh, your code becomes? Same thing with Ruby on Rails when it comes to resources. The more you can structure around a proper resource, Okay, the better your code will become and the easier it'll be to read and maintain and all this jazz. Okay, so the whole goal of Ruby on Rails is as much as possible structure your, uh, your kind of entities as resources. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. All right. So what is a RESTful resource? Again, REST has all these principles about how you interact with a resource. Okay, and we will be coding those as we go along. Okay. Our example that we're going to code is a news post. Or you can call it a blog post if you want. Okay? So you're going to have a website, and it's going to have a section that you click on called blog or news items or whatever. Okay? And when you click on that, you'll be able to have all these news items listed. You'll be able to create new news items. You'll be able to edit news items. You'll be able to destroy them, do whatever you want with them. Okay? That's what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to spend the next couple of weeks doing. Okay? And we're going to build this thing from scratch. Okay? I know. Uh, Probably some of you who have tried Ruby on Rails before have dealt with scaffolding. Okay, we're leading up to that. Okay, but we're going to build this thing from scratch so you understand the principles of RESTful resources. Okay, so here are some uh, principles uh, of REST. You know, things like resources must be uniquely identifiable. Okay, so every resource has to have some kind of unique identifier or some unique way to access it. If you act upon a resource. It's got to be able to be acted upon in a stateless way. So if I send an update command, it's got to have everything, everything it has, uh, every sorry, everything it needs in that update command. I shouldn't have to send multiple commands and have the resource remember the state of what it's in. Okay, that's that's stateless stuff. Um, it has to be operated in CRUD fashion. So create, read, update, destroy. Uh, again, among a lot of other things that I really personally don't understand. Okay. Um, so we're going to do this. And the really cool thing is that you have all these REST principles, but even further than that, you have web developers who basically said, we are going to implement REST using HTTP protocol. Okay? We've talked about HTTP 
HTTP protocol a lot. Hopefully, you guys understand, again, the idea of request and response. Right? That's what web is all about. Okay, so the web developer said, we can implement REST okay, with a standard set of requests and response okay, that adhere to all the REST principles. Okay, we, we will create a request and response that does creation. We'll do a, a, a request and response that does reading, that does updates, that does destroys. We will create a request and response that allows you to uniquely identify a specific news post, and so on and so forth. Okay? And that's what we're going to be building. Right? And this is what you should structure all your Ruby on Rails apps uh, around. Okay? So here's, here's an example. Okay? So if we were building a news post resource, a way to uniquely identify it would be whatever the host name is, slash news posts, plural, slash an ID, just a unique ID for every news post. Simple enough, right? Every new, if every news post has a unique ID, I should be able to access that each and every news post with a unique identifier. OK, the unique identifier in this case is the URI or the URL. OK? Here's an example of ways to interact with, uh, ways to interact with RESTful resources, OK? Creating might be a post. Reading might be a get. Update might be a put, and so on and so forth. But we're going to get into all that, OK? Again, this is a lot of theory, but just follow along. And this is effectively what we're building. OK? So a long time ago, I went over this diagram here. OK? And the idea was that this is how Ruby on Rails works. Every request that comes in hits the routes file. The routes file forwards you, forwards you to a controller which may or may not talk to a model that talks to a database, and then prepares a template that sends back to the browser. Okay? Burn this into your memory if you haven't already. Okay? This diagram that I'm showing you is basically four, four instances of that. Okay? So what we're going to be building is we're going to be building a request and a response to create an object. We're going to build a request and response to read an object. We're going to, we're going to build a request and response to update an object. We're going to build a, build a request and response to destroy an object. Okay? We're going to build all those routes and all those controller actions and ultimately act on what we call a model. Okay? So who here has done the database course? Okay, less than half. All right. Who here has ever used Excel before? Good. Who here has ever created a table of data before? Good. That's what databases essentially are. Okay, databases are essentially just a group of tables, okay, that store your data. Okay, everything you've done to date, everything you've coded, if you coded variables using IRB and stuff like that, as soon as you shut down your computer, those variables are lost, those values are lost, right? A database is a way for you to actually store data that the next time you turn on your computer, the next time you start up your server, that data is still there. So if you save a news post, it'd be nice if when I came back, that news post was still there, okay? That's what this diagram is here. This is a database. Okay, a database is just a bunch of tables, and every resource should have its own table. Okay, so users would have a table, news posts would have a table, products would have a table, comments would have a table, tags probably have a table. All these things would have tables. Okay, and typically you have one group of tables per web application. Okay, so if you Build a web application for your Facebook ripoff app, you have one database for that. If you build another application for a Twitter ripoff app, you have another database for that, and so on and so forth. So database per application, and that database has a bunch of tables in it. Okay? Any questions about what a database is? The one other interesting thing about databases is that the way they're designed is there's, there's specific languages that allow you to interact with the database. So the way you, you update the database, the way you grab information from the database, and so on and so forth. Uh, the most popular one right now is SQL, okay? although there's a lot of haters of SQL recently. And there's a lot of NoSQL databases coming out and stuff like that. So a lot of people think SQL is too bloated. I'm still a little bit old school. I like SQL. SQL backs a lot of Ruby on Rails apps. It doesn't have to, but it does. Okay. So SQL is a language that allows you to interact with databases. So rather than you scrolling through Excel and finding an entry in the row, there's actually a language that you can use to say, give me the row where the first name is John, and it'll spit, about, spit back a bunch of results and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is what we're building over the next couple of weeks. Now, we don't have any of this, by the way, right now. 
Well, we do have a pages controller, but that's separate from our news post controller. So we don't have a news post controller. I haven't really talked about what a model is. Okay, and I haven't really talked about how we get this database table together. So we have to build all this stuff. And the way we're gonna build all this stuff is we're gonna go from the bottom up. Okay, we're gonna go from the bottom up. So for going from the bottom up, we need to build a model and, and a database. Okay, after we have the model and the database, we're gonna start building the controller actions that interact with that model. And then above that, we have to build routes so that the browser can make requests in response to that. Okay, this is how you build a RESTful resource. And again, as much as possible, you want all your entities in your uh, uh, Ruby on Rails web application to be built using this model. Okay, maybe modified version of this model. You may have extra actions. You may have less actions. Maybe there's some that you can't create or you can't update, stuff like that. That's all fair, but they adopt this, this kind of uh, structure. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's start by building the model, and this is what the big lesson for today is, okay? So, um, like I said, before we get to the request and response layer, we're gonna need a way to store our news posts, okay? So what is a model? A model is basically a way in programming to represent uh, your data, okay? So we are using news posts as our example, as our, as our example, so we are going to build a news post model, okay? And a news post model really consists of two major parts, okay? A model will have a class in it, okay, so a blueprint, okay, for a in-memory version of your news post. What does that mean? It means you need a way to play around with your news post through your code. Okay, so Ruby on Rails code, you may want to say the news post uh, has a title of this and a body of this. You need a way to interact with that news post. Okay? And then the second thing it needs is a way to store that information. So once you've kind of created this news post in memory, you want to store it to the database so it's stored anytime you turn off your computer, turn it on or web. Okay? This is how a lot of web applications are built. Okay, so it's these two pieces that we need to build. We need to build a database table and we need to build an in-memory version of, of uh, this data. So how do we do that? Who has done this in Java before? Yeah. Okay, can you talk me through how you coded that? Or how you went about that? Uh, speaking in terms of classes and instances. Yeah. Yeah. So basically you create a class and it has a whole bunch of different attributes. And uh, within that, you have a method called store. And that store will contact the database. It'll save that instance and all of it, not that instance, but all the attributes of that class to a specific table in the database. And then when you want to load it up again, it'll have another method called load. And it'll read the database based on a specific ID or something like that. And it'll take the attributes from the database, repopulate it, and then you can use it again. Perfect. That's a great explanation. Do you remember how, like, did you code store and load yourself, or did you use a library? or? <laughs> okay. How, okay, knowing now, knowing that you've got it, do you know how you might guess store and load would be coded? Anyone want to take a stab? Right? S equals string. That, that's, that's exactly how, it would be, uh, how it's done a lot of the time. Okay? So remember how I said SQL is a language that allows you to write to the database, read from the database, uh, you know, do all these things to the database? So if you want to for example, put a entry into the database, okay? Let's say you, you already created a user's table and you wanna put an entry into the user's table, okay? What you might do is you might write a statement that looks something like this. Now, this is SQL language, okay? So I don't expect you guys to know this, um, but you might do something like this. Insert into the user's table, okay? Um, values like, uh, you know, first name, last name, and age. Okay, so this is a SQL statement that actually enters a row into your database. Just like you typing in Excel, okay, rather than you manually typing into Excel, this statement will do it for you. This is how you programmatically do it. Okay, so um, basically what, what we're talking about is the idea that in memory you may have things like this. So at first name equals Casey, at last name 
equals Lee at age equals 32. And then you might say like something like, okay, execute this statement, okay? And then where it says Casey, you know, you replace that with actual like variables. Okay, so this is what the, the save or store method might look like, something like that. Okay. And the load would be very similar. You'd be selecting out of the database to get information and then put that into an object, okay? The idea is that you basically have you basically have an object in the database, okay, that you can't play around with until you throw it into Ruby on Rails memory, okay? So you need some way to throw it into a Ruby on Rails object. And you need some way to whatever the changes you make here, save back to the database. This back and forth, this kind of pairing, everything we're talking about here is a Ruby on Rails model. Okay? It's a database entry that you can just extract out and start playing around with it. And then after you've done playing around with it, you can save it back to the database. Or you can create a brand new object and save that to the database and then read it later and so on and so forth. Okay? This is what we're doing when we build a model. Okay? Now, strictly speaking, there are some models that don't need to be permanently stored. Okay? But for our intents and purposes right now, we'll consider everything, every model that we're building is going to be stored permanently. Okay? Any questions about this? This is your database course in five minutes. Okay, we basically you don't have to take the database course anymore. <laughs> That's not true, though. you should definitely take it. Okay. So that is what we're building. Okay. Um, who who here has recently coded a web application? Okay, Brian, I'm gonna pick on you. How how did you okay, this this is just a class, right? Like a Java class? Uh, or well, I wasn't doing it with Java. Were you doing it with Ruby on Rails? Yeah. <laughs> okay, who's here has done it without Ruby on Rails? Okay, back to you. What's your name, sorry? Dylan. Dylan. Okay. Dylan, as far back as you can remember, can you think of an example of like like an object that you created? Um person book tender. Tender, yeah, like a payment, uh, like a whole tender document, like uh, okay, like something you would send out to subcontractors. Okay, a whole tender document that's sent out to subcontractors. Okay, let's use that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell process that not myself. Okay, what what kind of properties did that that tender have? Like, what were the attributes of that? Um, attached appendices. Attached appendices. This is like the most complex version. You can go easier if you, you want. I'm sorry. You, usually, usually it's person in our like, car, never real. No, this is good. This is a real world example. This is a real world example. Uh, so, sorry, what, what was a tender? Okay, and one of the properties was attached appendices. I'm assuming that was a bunch of objects as well? Yeah, it could be one and then. Okay. Four and zero. All right, what else? What were some primitive values you had in there? Um, closing date. Closing date. What else? Um, items that are in the tender and their prices. Okay, so items and they would have prices and so on. Okay. So see what Dylan's doing here is that he understands that a tender has these attributes. Okay, just like a blog post would have a title and a body and a date and so on and so forth. Okay. Did you have an ID on that? By the way? Yes. A unique, a unique identifier. Good. Okay. Uh, can anybody tell me why it might be a good idea to have a unique identifier on a object? It might be easier to find. It might be easier to find. That's good. Okay. Uh, why would it be bad to use one of these fields as a unique identifier? You can have repeats. Okay. So a really good way to ensure that you have truly a unique identifier, okay, is just to create a column called ID. And make sure it's like a serial number, okay, or like an integer, and okay, that can never be repeated, right? I mean, a lot of times when we design these databases and stuff like that, sometimes we say, you know what, first name and last name will always be the same. That's the worst example, right? Because first name and last name will very well be the same for a lot of people, right? Uh, you start getting complex primary keys and so on and so forth. Unique identifier, the easiest way to do it is just always put an ID on there, okay, and, and have it an integer, okay? That's a good common software practice. Every database table that you create, put an ID on there. Okay, you're, you're safer going that route than saying, I'll, I'll do it for some, not for others, okay? Some may strictly not need it, but you're safer to do it that. 
Okay, back to Dylan. Database. What database were you using? Uh, MySQL. MySQL. Okay, so MySQL is a good example of a SQL based database. Okay? My, MySQL uses the SQL language. Okay? Postgres is another one that uses it. SQLite is another one that uses it. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server is another one that uses it. Informix, if anybody has heard of that, used to use it. Oracle is a, a big one that uses it. Okay? These are all databases that use the same general SQL language. Okay? MySQL is a very popular one because uh, you can get it for free and uh, it's, it's very powerful. Um, so anyways, MySQL database. Um, do you remember creating a table for the tenders? Yes. Okay. Uh, what did you call that table? If you were to call it today, does that make sense? <laughs> tenders. Tenders. That's a good name. Okay. So Dylan, what he did is he created a table called tenders. Okay, and every entry had an ID, so one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Every entry had a closing date. Obviously, you guys can't read this, and a bunch of other stuff, right? All with a bunch of values. Now, when Dylan wanted to play around with these values, what he was doing is calling that load function he's talking about. This Ruby on Rails object had a function that you could load an entry into memory. And what it would basically do is it would execute a SQL statement to grab this entry and extract all the values into variables of that object. When he was done with it, he wrote those values back to the database. And again, this is what we're doing. Okay? And this is what your database for us normally. Okay? Well, I think so. Okay. Any questions about the general concept here? Okay. Do you remember how you created this table? Like, uh, did, you code, did you code a SQL statement to create it? Or just Create tenders. Yeah. So, so what Dylan's talking about is there is a command to actually create these tables. There's a command to select from select entries. There's a command to delete entries. There's a command to insert entries. All this stuff like that. There's also a command to create tables. Okay. There's a SQL command called create table, and you give it a name. And you give it a bunch of values to say create table uh, called tenders. It has a closing date. It has an ID. It has items and so on and so forth. Okay? There is a statement to do that. What happens when you want to update that table? Did you create another statement? Right. There's another statement. What was that? Update. Update. Okay. Or alter table. Okay. You can do. It. Sorry, I was probably speaking not very clearly there. To up, sorry to, to change the columns, for example, or delete columns. Or change the name of the of the and, and so on and so forth. To do all that, you might create another statement that says alter table, add another column. Because I forget, as your software grows, you want to add more columns and so on and so forth, right? How many of you have gone through this exercise before? Okay, not very many. So that's good. This, this is kind of new. Okay. This is what we call database maintenance. There are people who are their full-time job is called a DBA, database administrator. And they maintain this database and they communicate this information to everybody. They say, hey, by the way, I've added a new column to your table. You can use it. Okay, by the way, I've taken away that column. Make sure you don't use it in your code. Okay? By the way, I've changed the name of tenders to uh, you know, uh, real tenders because we have another table called pending tenders. Okay? Make sure you change your code to do that. This is what database administrators have done for a really long time. Now, you can, you can see that this gets really not great, especially if you're dealing with a crappy database administrator. Right? What if I'm your database administrator and I'm taking a nap, as I tend to do a lot, and I'll be like, you know, uh, I'll just finish the code submitted. Okay, I'm going to go take a nap. And then you're working on code, you're like, why the hell is this breaking? You updated your database and your code's all breaking, all stuff like that. This becomes an issue. Okay, and believe it or not, probably a lot of you guys still do this, and a lot of companies still do this, right? And there's no real logic to how to maintain this database and communicate to all coders. And for a lot of things, that's okay. Like documentation is not such a big deal. But something that's so inherently tied to code, it would be nice if we had a standard way to manage this stuff. So when Dylan creates a table, everybody knows about it. And in fact, everybody can easily create that table off of it. They don't have to email him for that create statement. Did you generally save these statements in a file or something? No. No. Perfect example. Thanks. That worked out well. If you said yes, that's like, oh, okay, you're confirmed. Generally, we didn't save this information. Okay? Let's say we're working together, okay? And I create a table and I don't tell you about it. Okay? And then I give you the code to run. 
And your code says the table doesn't exist. Well, yeah, you didn't tell me. Oh, man, I forgot to email you that statement. Let me copy and paste the statement and email to you. Okay? This is what happens a lot. All right? Is that, that database maintenance is generally you directly send statements to here rather than programmatically through a Ruby on Rails to manage this. Okay? Because these are essentially two separate entities. I forgot to mention that. That's a pretty big piece. Ruby on Rails and the database are effectively two separate entities that you can program to talk to each other, but you can also manage separately completely. It's like if you were running statements to update an Excel spreadsheet, and then you open that Excel spreadsheet in Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel and start like, editing. You're editing it directly rather than going to the code. Okay? So this is why Ruby on Rails developers came up with a way to get some sanity around. So that when Dylan does make a code change, part of that code change are his database updates. Okay? We call these database updates migrations. Okay? Database migrations. Cat learned this the hard way. Cat was a student in the previous class and she learned this the hard way. Okay? Database migrations are basically saved scripts to update your database uh, schema. Okay, what I mean by schema is the tables, in terms of what their names are, what their columns are, what type the columns are, not the actual data inside it, okay? So if you were to, to have a tenders uh, table with ID, closing date, items, and so on and so forth, and you want to add a column, that's changing the schema. Okay, the schema is like the specification of what can be stored in there, not the data itself, okay? The SQL language can handle both. The SQL language can edit the schema, but can also edit the data that's inside that screen. Okay? Database migrations, not always, but generally, are all about updating your schema. So that if you create a table, if you delete a table, if you update a column, if you all, whatever you do, okay, that there's a piece of code that someone else can run so that their code is up to date. Okay? That's what migrations are all about. It's a hugely powerful thing. And in fact, I think if you guys don't do this in other languages, you should start adopting this principle. Okay, the idea that anytime you write a statement, you put it into a migration so that you can send that code to somewhere else. So can, can you imagine if Dylan did a create table and did an alter table and saved it chronologically and just sent it to me so that I can run those chronologically and then my database would be exactly the same as the That's the advantage of migrations. Any questions about migrations? Okay, so it turns out Ruby on Rails, because they're so big on migrations and they're big on this pairing of a Ruby on Rails object and a database table associated with it, they have a code generator that generates the script to create the table, which is the migration, and the object itself. Okay, and we're going to run this. Okay, this is something that comes built in with Ruby on Rails. Okay, so fire up your terminal or your console or whatever it is. Okay, command prompt. Make sure you go to your uh, dev Rails projects test app. And we are going to create our first model. And our first model is going to be the news post, OK? So the way we're going to do this is once you're inside your app folder, OK? So make sure you're inside the test app. OK, you're going to run Rails generate model. OK, that's the generic way to generate a model. And if you're a pro coder, and now you're going to become one, you don't even have to type generate. You can just type G. Rails G means generate. Okay. And Rails S for Rails server. And you're going to give your model a name. In our, in our case, it's going to be a news post. The model is always singular. Okay, It's always singular. And you can generally put it in two types of casing. But I prefer to do it a certain way because it makes you remember how the model class is named. So I like to do that as camel case, OK? The news post. It's always singular camel case, OK? Again, for those of you who are new to the word camel case, it's like a camel because that has humps, OK? So news post. You could technically stop there if you wanted. That would create you a model for sure. And you could hit enter. You'd be good to go. 
Okay, but I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further because this rail generic actually takes a lot of extra arguments. And the arguments that follow it, okay, are, uh, are attributes, okay? We talked about the tender, the tender has closing date, ID, uh, attached, uh, appendices, item, and so on and so forth. Our news post is going to have properties, right? Our, most news posts have a title, right? Most news posts have a body. Uh, most news posts probably have an updated date. Most news posts probably have a created date. It's actually maybe more important than the updated date. And again, as smart programmers, we probably want the ID to be there as well, right? Okay, so let's let's add all those, okay? And so you can actually type all this within the generator, and it'll be smart enough to create everything it needs for you, okay? So uh, let's create, it's going to have a title. So these are all lowercase. And you're going to give it a type, okay? String. Uh, let's say it also has a body. Now, string, uh, by the way, has a limited 255 character by default. Uh, if you want unlimited characters, you use uh, a type called text. Okay. So body, I don't want to limit that, so I'll, I'll, I'll make that as a text. Um, and we can leave it at that. Um, but I said ID, updated that, created that, and so on and so forth. Okay. Remember how I said it's a really good idea it's a really good idea to put an ID on every one of your resources. Okay, it's also a really good idea to have a modified date and a created date on most of your resources. Okay, those are generally good practices. Okay, you may not use them, but it's really nice to have that information so you can always debug and all that stuff like that. Right. In fact, they're such good ideas that Ruby on Rails includes them by default. Okay, by default, if you put no, if you put nothing else, it'll automatically include an ID. Automatically include a created at and automatically include an updated at timestamp. Okay, so we actually don't have to put that information in. So title and body. I mean that, that's that's a pretty basic blog post or a news post, right? Okay, so make sure you have all this right, okay, because this will do a lot of stuff for you. So make sure again your title is named properly, your body named properly, they have the right types, news post is singular, very important, uh, and your Rails generate model. Okay. Enter. Okay, something that I didn't do enough of when I started learning Ruby on Rails is actually read the output of what happened, okay? So this is what happened. It said when, when it did this, it invoked a method from active record, okay? Invoking is not really that important unless you really want to research how the Ruby on Rails code is working. But what's more important is the files that it created for me. It created two files at the top, one called db-migrate, Timestamp create news posts, and as another one called app slash model slash news post, and created two files under the test folder. You can ignore the test folders for now, okay? Test driven development, unit testing, and all that jazz is outside the scope of this course. And to be honest, I'm not that big of an expert on it, okay? But the first two are what's important because the very first one, that timestamp underscore create news post.rb, that is a script that runs create table news posts with these columns. Okay, that is the script that Dylan wrote on his computer, didn't save it, and didn't email it to me. What a jerk. Okay, if he was using Ruby on Rails, he wouldn't have to do it because it's automatically done for him. And all he'd have to do is send that file to me or check it in the source code so that when I check out my source code, that is, is sent to me as well. Okay, now it's very important to know that that is just the script that creates the table. We haven't actually created the table yet. That's just a script that allows you to create the table so you can send it around to all your programmers and get them to run that script on their computers to create that table. Okay. So create the script. I haven't actually created the table yet. Okay. And then the second one is actually our class. Okay, that is our class for news posts. So we can instantiate it, we can set values on it. And what's really cool is because you specify properties like title and body, it has getters and setters for title and body. It has um, all the typical things like save and load. I mean, they're named differently, but it has all those uh, things built into it, okay? Because you created it this way, Ruby on Rails injected a whole whack of common code into it that you don't have to code, okay? So two very important files that happen when you generate a model. The script to create the database table and the actual class to play around with it in memory. Any questions on that? Okay. Now the question is, 
where's the database? Where is this Excel spreadsheet that I keep talking about? Okay. Now, this really depends on how your Ruby on Rails app is configured. You can configure it to point to a MySQL database. Okay, that would be a database that's running on your machine somewhere. Okay, it has a server that you can talk to and create databases and create tables and all this stuff. Postgres is the same way. Microsoft. Most databases are called are called server databases. In other words, there's a piece, there's a program running on your system that you're able to talk to and create these things. Okay, Postgres works this way. My, Microsoft SQL Server works this way. Uh, My SQL works this way. All these work this way. There is one really popular one though that doesn't work this way. And it's called SQL Lite. SQL Lite actually is, is still a SQL database, so you can still send the commands and so on and so forth. But it actually doesn't have a server. It doesn't have a program running that you can interact with. You can interact directly with the file in some library that you have in your in your code. Okay? Uh, and it's really just one file. Okay, and because you created your Ruby on Rails app in a default way, that file actually exists already. So if you open up your code and you look under DB, you'll see a development.sqlite3. Okay, this is a SQL database. Okay, you obviously can't understand it through just looking at the plain text version of it, but this is a database that you can send SQL statements to, to create tables, to delete tables, to insert data, and all that jazz. Okay, so this is really cool because now Ruby on Rails like packages in a database for you right inside the app. When you do Rails new app, we, we did a while back, it actually created a database for you. Okay, so there's an empty database, there's an empty uh, Excel spreadsheet there waiting for tables to be created, waiting for data to be loaded in, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is an empty database right now, okay? So the question is how do we fill it with that table? Okay, we have, we have this script somewhere, and we want to run that script so that it updates the table. Okay, so let's look at that script. We're going to create a DB, migrate, timestamp, create news posts. So where are we here? DB, migrate, create news posts. There it is. This is a, this is a piece of Ruby code, okay, that it ends up translating into SQL statements. Okay, that ends up translating to create table, to create a table that has a title that's a type string, the body of type text, and timestamps added to it. Okay, and by the way, create table also adds IDs. Okay, we'll get into migrations in more detail if we have time. But basically, know that this is the piece of code that anybody who downloads your app, okay, sorry, downloads the source code to your app, can run to update their database. And you can see how this becomes very useful because. The more you create more and more tables, every one of those tables will have this will have this associated migration, and you can just run all those migration stuff in your database. It's a really smart way to keep your your databases in sync with each other. Okay, so how do we run it? It's actually really easy. A rake task. Okay, a rake task. Uh, think of it as Ruby make. If you don't know what make is, I don't really know what make is to be honest. I'm not a C programmer. Uh, you can think of it as almost like a, a compile statement kind of. Okay, this is a certain piece of Ruby code that's put into Ruby on Rails, and there's a bunch of commands you can run here. Okay, one of those commands you can run is db create. Okay, that'll actually create the database. Now, if we run this, it'll probably tell us that the database already exists because it automatically does that. Um, but you can try it out. Break db create. Yeah, it, it already exists, right? Because when we ran Rails new, that already got created. This would be different if you're hooking it up to MySQL or Postgres and stuff like that, okay, where it can't automatically create the database. When you run rakedb create, it creates that database. And then how do we actually run the migration? Rakedb migrate. Now what that does is it runs a create table called news posts and create a table for us. Now our database has a table called news posts, okay? Plural version of the model. So now we have everything we need for the model. We have the database table, and we have the class. Now the class may be a little bit empty, but we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it, okay? So let's take a look at the class. Where was the class created? So we look here, this is where the migration was created. Here's where the model class was created. App models news post. Uh, where are we? App. 
models, news post. Very empty. There's nothing in it. That's the most bare minimum class you could ever have. OK? News post extends active record base. What Dylan was talking about was creating methods for saving, okay, for loading. Okay. You may have a bunch of these. You may have something like load all. You get to load every record into an array, for example. You may have things like uh, find by ID. Okay, and you may code all this stuff. Okay. Again, these are all very common things. These are very common things when it comes to web applications, all these kind of methods. Every good web application or even any good database application has these methods on the news post. Okay? That's why, again, Ruby on Rails codes it for you. Okay? The fact that this thing extends active record base gives you a whole host of methods for free. Almost everything you can think of that you would do with a model is already there. Okay, it's pretty crazy. So without even doing anything and just extending this active record base class, I'll show you some of the cool things you can do. But I just want, want to let you know, okay, we're, we're closing here, but I want to let you know that you're effectively done coding your model. Okay, you have a database table that has a title, a body, an ID, last created and, and updated or whatever. You have a class that you can instantiate from that, okay? So there's going to be some code that strips a record out of this and throws it into here, okay? And that's all contained in this class here. You have everything you need to get going on a model, OK? And what did I say? The controller interacts with the model, OK? But what if I just want to play around with the model code and see what the model is capable of, OK? I can use IRB, OK? We played around with IRB. And if you haven't watched the video on getting to know Ruby, you'll know what IRB is. But IRB is basically a playground for you to type random Ruby code and see what happens, OK? But what if I want to ch test out Ruby code, but also some classes that I've coded myself? I coded this news post class myself. I want to test that, that out myself, OK? The way you can do that is by running what's called the Rails console, OK? The Rails console is basically IRB, so a place to play around with your code. But it also has all your Ruby on Rails application classes loaded in there as well. So you can play around with those, OK? I'm sure Java coders uh, have some similar version of this. But when I was coding Java, I would do a lot of console dot, not console dot log. Print line, is that what it is? System dot out dot print line, you know, and debug and type a lot of stuff to test it out. Okay, before I'd act, like I'd have to code. Maybe I code a separate, you know, uh, uh, static main so I could test out my code there, right? Or just create a brand new interface just so I could test my code. Okay, Ruby on Rails has a built-in tool for this, which is really nice. So you can play around with that model code before you start coding your controller. Okay, so the way you do that is make sure you're still in your application folder and you type Rails C. Okay, or Rails console, same thing. Okay, Rails C. Now what this does is it loads up all the Ruby libraries, like string, integers, so on and so forth. And it also loads any classes that you coded, like news post. Okay. So just like IRB, I can do things like this, you know, type in, you know, you know, random code here. You know, I could do like all my all my Ruby uh, code I can just play around with here to test it out, right? It's a really good place to test things out. Okay, but you can also test your new uh, your new class news post. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly run, run through a couple of uh, built-in methods that news post has just from extending Active Record, and any other model that you create this way will have all these methods. Okay, so let's say I want to grab all the news posts from the database. Okay. Uh, hopefully, the object-oriented programmers here know the difference between a class or static method and an instance method. Okay, anytime you're fetching information from the database, it's typically static class methods. Okay, so let's say I want to get um, all my news posts. Okay. Now again, almost everything in Ruby is lowercase underscore except for class names. Okay. Class names are camel case, and constants are all capitals. But generally, everything else, method names, variable names, are all lowercase underscore. Okay, so all my news posts, if I want to grab them, the news post class has a method called all. It built in because it extends active record base. Now, what should I get back here? Nothing, right? Because we haven't loaded anything. But let's make sure we hit enter. 
Okay, we get this empty array. And what's really cool is you can see it's actually executed a SQL statement to get that. Right? You can see that what it did was it did select news posts dot star from news posts. Okay, for those who know SQL, you'll recognize that. Okay. It also has cool things like this. News post dot first. Where it just grabs the first record. Okay? Which in this case happens to be nil because we haven't loaded it. What if I want to instantiate? How do we instantiate in Java? Somebody, how would we instantiate news post in Java? New, New right? It'd be uh, news post my variable equals new news posts with brackets and any parentheses that, that or sorry, any parameters that it may have, right? In Ruby, it's just the class dot new. Okay, and remember uh, Ruby's loosely typed, so we don't have to say what type of variable it is. So I could say my new news post, news post dot new, and that creates a new news post. Okay, that creates an instance in memory. I'll take to the database yet. All in memory. Stuff. Because it extends active record, it's smart enough to look at the database columns it's associated with and give getters and setters for all those. Okay? So I could say now my new news post dot title equals uh, well, or my site has launched. Now if I look at my news post again, or my new news post, see now the title is my site has launched. Okay? We've created that and updated that and ID. I said they were automatically created for those. If I want to, if I want to get that value back, I can just use it as an accessor. Okay. I can set the body if I want. Uh, today is a great day for my website. As launched. I always go back and forth in my head on the phone. Something funny or something mundane. Okay, so there it's saved. Okay, so in memory, I'm saving all these values okay, into this object. Okay. And again, be very careful about what I'm dealing with here. This is the variable, remember? That's the class up there that created an instance. Okay. And now let's say I want to save this to the database. Well, that's built in as well. Okay, any instance of an active record, you can simply call dot .save, and that saves it to the database. You can see it. it did it. Insert into news post. Da, 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 da. Okay. All built in for you. All these common things that you would code or use something like Hibernate for, they Ruby on Rails ships with by default. Okay. Very powerful active record. Okay. So now you can now let, let's try to get the news post out again. Okay. So let's say like news posts, news post dot all. And now when now when it comes back, I have this array of a single news post. In Okay, so very, very powerful stuff. Any questions? Okay, so this is the kind of code that we will be putting into our controller, right? Because I, I showed you how to create a new news post. I showed you how to save it to the database. I showed you how to read some news post, like all the news posts out from, uh, from the database, and okay, things like that. This is stuff we'll be putting in the controller to prep a response for the user, okay? But effectively, what we've done is we finished coding the model. And really, as you get good at this, you can see how fast that is. Really, all you had to do, uh, actually, I think it's in this window. Really, all you had to do is this one statement to create the migration and the class, and then this statement to run, sorry, this statement to run the migration, and then you're finished. And that's it. That's how you create models, OK? No more creating a bunch of variables, no more creating all your SQL statements, no more any of that, okay? Two statements, you're done your models. Question. In your model, yeah. uh, in Ruby, Sublime Mesh, uh, you don't have any attributes. Like coming from a Java background, like usually you have your attributes in here and then all of your methods and everything. But I understand the methods are in active records now, but what about the attributes themselves? Like the... Like body and title. Right. So what this does when you extend active record. In the background, actually, to be honest, what happens is that Ruby on Rails uses something called uh, no method or something like that. It's this built-in thing where you can override uh, a function called no method to do stuff for you. So if, if no method exists, 
you can override what happens in the latter case. Okay, so like, let's say I type, like, because clearly right now this doesn't have a method called title, right? Like there's no method called title, and there's no setter called title, right? Like these don't exist right now because I didn't type them, right? So what happens is when you type in dot title, okay, it's gonna look at active record bases, no method, error, uh, uh, no method, method, okay? And in there, there's a whole whack of code that Ruby on Rails developers have developed. And one part of that logic, it says, go and look at the database and see if this column exists. And if it does, okay, create a variable on this instance with that value. Okay, so it does a lot of this dynamic programming, which is like really powerful stuff. So um, what happened is it also does the same thing for title equals. So when you do the setter, it does the same thing. It says, oh, this doesn't exist. Go to that method. Somewhere in that it says, go look at the database columns and see if there is a column name this. Okay, sorry, that was the setter. Getter, then say select star from da da da, grab that value out and assign it to a variable on this, on this instance. If you wanted to add a bit, uh, an attribute to news posts, yeah. say like created date, uh, yep. example, uh, something so else that hasn't been there. Yet. Yeah, uh, you would just have so so the question. Yeah, so the question is, what happens if again I want to add a new column to my database? Right? Knowing now that this is dynamic to the database, well, we'll get into that. But basically, the, the short answer is you create a new migration that adds a column to that database, and by default, like as soon as you are able to type in dot author, it'll look to go through the same process, and it'll be there right. And you don't through. have to do anything. You don't have to do anything with this. In fact, this stays very, very simple. Okay, there are a lot of other things that belong in the model, things like validations uh, on data, uh, things like extra, I mean, general like extra methods that you would put in an object that you need as like helpers, you know, things like that to make things easier. But simple getters and and, and setters, uh, you don't have to do anything besides write a migration, and then it'll be automatically available. So you can't just update it. You can't just update the database. No. You could. But what's the issue then? The issue is, what if you update your database and you don't, yeah, you don't save it, right? So it's really just a good program practice. Okay, you can very, you could definitely do it. There's nothing technologically blocking you from doing that. You can go into your database if you're if you're proficient in databases and update that. But the problem is that update that you did is not checked into your code and it's not spread out to everybody. So that's why we use this, okay? Because this is part of your source code, right? This migration is part of your source code. So that everybody can run it. Okay, and just last, lastly to mention, um, I'll probably mention this again next week. But when you run rake db migrate, it's smart enough to know what migrations you've already run, and that's why it timestamps them. Okay, as soon as you run rake db migrate, it logs in the database. I run this migration. So that when you run it again, it only runs the ones that you have. So let's say you're at migration two or three, and Dylan's at migration ten. Right, you need seven migrations to run. So when you run rake db migrate, as long as you checked out the code with all those migrations in it, it'll run all. Okay, so it's more of a good programming practice than a technological like stop. Okay, uh, and again, I, I recommend you do it this way, and that way, all your data databases will be in sync. One of the first things you do when you code collaboratively with Ruby on Rails is you check out the code, you run migrations, and then you start coding. Cool. All right, very cool stuff. Very very cool stuff. Any questions? Okay, so we are uh, in this room now, Mondays, five thirty to seven. Um, so I'll see you guys next week, and thanks again. If you have any questions, I'll be around for a bit. Uh, if there's another class coming in, I'll probably step outside so we can talk outside. Okay, thanks.